Welcome to the Right Place podcast, where we learn with you how to navigate the world by building connections that matter, relationships that last, and businesses that thrive. My name is John Watson, and today I'm joined by Rudolf Rauschenbach, my co-host and collaborator. And Rudolf, how are you today? I'm good, I've been a bit sick over the last week, so my throat's acting up every now and then. But uh, other than that, the busy world to um, actively involved in a few community things at the moment. And then we're yeah, just looking out for a bit of a break uh, coming up soon. How's it going on your side, John? Excellent. Yeah, I know I'm having some really nice days um, in Cape Town, playing a little bit of paddle, hoping to play some, some golf uh, coming up soon and also spending some extra time with the family. Um, we are really looking forward to our discussion today. You and I met many years ago, at, which was probably your first job, um, first real job after your year of academic articles. And today we want to talk about getting your first job, um, staying in your first job, and how you should connect or, or network in your first job. Um, so, Rudolf, maybe right from the get-go, you studied CA at the University of Portestrum, and then you ended up at academic articles. How did how did you make that decision? Did you not want to go to the CA firm immediately, or did you see it as a benefit to go that then articles route? Yeah, interesting, interesting question. I um, yeah, I don't draw around the comments here. Surprisingly, my undergrad wasn't as great, but the average year I it clicked. I obviously studied that because I didn't want to do it twice, and then. Um, yeah, this opportunity came up where they invited us to, to apply. Yeah, two things ran through my mind. One was, um, I remember it was my wife and she was still studying. So it was an opportunity to still be in touch with Stroom at the time where she's still studying. And um, instead of me coming to Pretoria, um, we could be together for another year and then um, close that gap of, of one year apart um, a little bit. But the second part was also that I, I really did like the training aspect, I, and I'm still involved in training, and I'm still um, actively doing it. So it was something that was appealing to me, and I thought by by being there, um, it could give me a bit of a stepping stone into that world um, in the future potentially. So that was my two main considerations. Never really back into academics though, but um, yeah, made a. Um, different connections with a lot of influential guys and lecturers and so on at the time. Uh, and some of them are still there. I had one person that I worked with quite a bit at the time, and we actually started an action cricket team that year with uh, some of the other lecturers. He's now the dean of the faculty there. Um, so a good connection yeah. to have and a person to know um, if, if ever I need someone in that space um, to, to connect with someone. So. I don't think it was a year wasted, but um, definitely set me back against my peers who went into the, the former work environment afterwards where the, the Excel skills for one um, increased exponentially compared to mine who, who did the same type of things. And then also just getting into a new space and so on. So it was a nice year. I'm not, I don't regret doing that, but it's not... Um, it probably didn't work out the way I thought it would at the time, but I did build up a, a nice um, secondary network at the moment of people in that space that I've, I wouldn't have had the chance to meet otherwise. You also went um, working at a smaller firm initially before you came to the AG. So, so that year of ours actually, um, we, we came into the AG as second years, but what made you go to the smaller firm firstly? And second thing is, uh, why would you switch then to the AG later on? Yeah, great question, Rudolf. It was a very interesting time in my life. I thought I was good enough to get into the big four audit firms. I'd applied everywhere. I'd gone to the open days, spoken to the people. But for some other reason, either my marks or my personality, I was very quiet back in the day. Um, it just didn't fit. And I had one or two interviews, but it just didn't happen. And then I had to network. I had to find a job. My, my, my CTA year is coming to an end. I need to make a plan. And there was a gentleman in our church, uh, Mr. Trevor Albertine, who worked at a small firm in Brooklyn in Pretoria. And I went to speak to him and he said, yeah, you can come and join in. 
And yeah, that's pretty much how um, I ended up at the small firm. I had to network my way into my, my first job and, and make a good impression. But then moving to the AG was another networking um, thing that happened for me. In the middle of my, my first year of articles, while I was at the small firm, um, it was a quiet time for the firm, um, June and July. So it's after the mad rush of, of February, March, April, getting a lot of the financial year is done. And in the public sector, the busy time of the year is June, July, and probably a little bit of August, um, when the uh, government entities their financial statements end of May. So I was contracted out to the Auditor General for six weeks. And that is the Auditor General in Victoria, and that's where I met Mariana and Belinda and Vickers, and we were on the seat to audit. And I spent six weeks in a totally different audit environment, meeting new people, attending training sessions on how the CETAs work, how government works, um, and things like that. And that is when I, my eyes were opened to the public sector. And to be honest, they were getting paid double what I was getting paid. And they had a bit more benefits in terms of study leave, in terms of normal annual leave. And you, you got a free laptop. I didn't have to pay for my laptop like I had at, at, at the small firm. So when you're earning almost nothing, um, anything double nothing sounds like a lot of money and, and a lot more beneficial. So I went to, to speak to the, the training partner at the small firm and said, look, dude, I'm going to jump. I'm going um, I'm going to make the move. And that's when he told me about the, the six months penalty um, that you have as a, as a sniper trainee if you, if, if you change ship. And I was like, that's 100% fine with me. I think the, the pros outweighed the cons definitely. And I had a good working relationship with some of the people at the AG. So I was really looking forward to, um, to work with Mariana, to meeting some new people. And I actually remember walking into Alice's office uh, right there in the corner at National D. Um, and Mariana was there. And they would go to the names of the trainees. And Mariana said... John's working for me. So she made sure that Alice, the big boss, knew that I wasn't just coming to National Tea to go water fairs or anything else. I was going to come and work for, for Mariana. So, so she, she put me on the list to work um, on, on Labor and the CETAs. And, yeah, I really appreciated that. And, yeah, that's when we met that January 2006 um, when I joined the AG. And we sat in that boardroom together and it all started from there. Yeah, I I need to get this up with Mariana then because she interviewed me for two or three times and never never took me onto her team. So it might have been very similar, but it might have been a sort of professional decision I never said and to find out. And I think um, to move one step back, uh, John, if I if I listen to the conversation as we're going on. These decisions can have a major impact in one's life. We I, I very clearly remember getting the bursary from the AG going into studies, which I probably wouldn't have done. I potentially would have studied part-time and worked at a small firm and, and gone through that route, which I don't think I would have made it. Um, I wouldn't have potentially been a CA. It's such a tough route to go through. But um, what... What happened was, as I finished my honors year, my brother came to me and said, listen, don't go to the AG. Don't go there. You're going to get stuck in public sector. It's not a nice place to work. And so all these negative things about the public sector. And I didn't have, what, 300,000 rand to refund or repay the AG at the time. And I said, listen, I'm not going anywhere else. I'm going there because one, one, I have commitment. And secondly, I've got this massive liability if I don't go. Um, and not for one second in my life uh, do I think back and I regret going there. Um, I think it was destined to be. It was the way my, my life was supposed to go. And, but such a decision, that those type of decisions, your decision to shift from the small firm to, to the AG, mind you go there, had a major impact on the, the way my professional career and my life actually went after that because then it got rooted in your mission in the public sector. And what you said was right, I'm, I'm going to get into the public sector. The fact is, I didn't mind being there. I didn't mind the public sector, but um, it could be that you, you just major tax guru 
and, and you want to be in the tax space, but now you're stuck in the public sector and there's not a lot of tax work and so on. So these decisions define the, your career path and, and it's very important to to make those decisions with a long-term view in mind as well, not just a, a quick change or, or something that you believe, oh, I don't like it here, I'd rather go. If you don't like it somewhere, it's half the time, it's also you, it's also yourself. So so make it work for yourself, but uh, they definitely have a major impact um, going forward. So, so what would you say then is are the things that we need to look out for in making this decision firstly and but you said you, you almost networked your way into this new position, into this new career path or job. job. What, what are the things to look out for in making a decision firstly? And secondly is uh, how do you actually connect with the right people to make this career path change work for you? I think one of the things you have to keep in mind is eventually you need to do things for yourself. You can't do things to follow your friends around, to be the same as them, be in the in-group. Um, you're going to run out of talent there eventually. You need to do things for yourself. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's a couple of signs along the path that other warning signs or opportunity signs, and you need to be pay attention to those. You don't want to have a life of regret. It's, oh, I should have taken that opportunity. So I think awareness is... A massive thing awareness that even at a young age you can make incredibly big decisions there's a video that i shared with the the, the nap group at the cbn uh, from jeff bezos where he says in today's age a lot of things are given to younger people and they think they can just do whatever they want everything like that but eventually your choices catch up with you. and you want your choices to catch up with you in a good way you want to understand um, that if I choose this path, this other path might be closing. So I can't eventually do everything under the sun. I can't eventually, I'm studying the CA, but I actually like engineering, but I'm really interested in tax, but I like painting as well. You, you're going to just confuse yourself um, eventually. So I think you need to pay attention to your choices. And also you need to then do something. You need to then make a decision. Indecision and waiting, and I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. You're never going to have everything um, yeah, you know, you're going to have everything planned out ahead of you. When I signed up for the age, I didn't know what I was actually signing up for. I knew I enjoy these people and the benefits are better. That was pretty much it. I didn't know the culture, the values, the vibe. I didn't know who all the bosses were. So it is still a bit of a shot in the dark. Um, I think if we also then pay attention to, um, what we want to achieve and where we are most comfortable to achieve these things. If something is making you uncomfortable or this isn't quite me, or I don't think I've got the effort or the energy to do something, pay attention to that type of stuff. Don't frustrate yourself um, into, into a situation and then just hate yourself for the rest of your life. Um, Gary V, um, who also follow LinkedIn and YouTube, great guy. He talks a lot to 30 to 40 year olds. And just say, that, guys, we haven't messed up everything, but you need to sometimes take responsibility for, for, for your decisions. You need to think, what am I doing? Where am I going? But not then compare yourself to others. Everyone is on their same path. Um, like we discussed recently, you get CAs that are starting businesses in varsity and becoming multimillionaires, be earning more money from their side hustle than from their articles. Um, not everyone's born to do that. Not everyone's path aligns um, to do that. So I think pay attention to your choices, be aware of what's going on around you, and then actually make a decision to to do something next. Um, would you agree with that? Uh, you, you mentioned um, looking at um, value. And a while ago we spoke about um, giving value to your network. Um, mm. What I think up is... You really need in that environment, be it a group for six weeks, but you you actually added value in such a manner, in such a way that Mariana came and said, listen, I want to join my team. She wouldn't have done that if she realized that, listen, this guy is a slacker. He's not, so he's not going to get me to where I need to be. So if you have that opportunity, if I was a youngster now and, and I tried it in Katoon, Katoon is such a small place with not a lot of 
privately owned business, unfortunately. But I, if I was a youngster now, I would have, would have tried to do some holiday work in, in the industry that you want to go into. And firstly, it opens up your eyes as to what this industry is really about. If you want to be an architect, go and see what they do. Go and go and bundle for a week. Go and sit and, and understand their environment. See what they what they do. What is the the job really about? You learn such a lot of things at varsity, but you don't actually get to see it and practice until you get there. And you might realize that listen, what I thought it was and what it really is is two completely different things. So. I make those mistakes or try and learn from school already or from holidays and times in adversity. Try and see where you can. And obviously, if you're 40 or 50 already, you, you sit in a certain direction. And then your, your needs might not be to decide on a career path, but rather to, to see how do I can work with the next person that will employ me. How do I connect a good relationship with my next client? And the principles are exactly the same. You will not be able to do it if you don't get into the space. And, and when you yeah. get into the space, you need to add value. You need to offer them something. And it's not money. It's not product. It's, it's actually value in terms of connections, value in terms of um, advice, free advice that you can give them linking up, them up with a great person and so on. And once you start doing that, you actually become valuable to them and they would want you in their team or they would want to do business with you. So the same principles apply straight through. Um, I think it's just a, a bit more difficult to, to change direction, obviously, when you're a bit older, you're already in a career. But both myself and you, we've done it before. So it can be done. It's just... The hard work. I think there are certain things that um, people need to look out for when they start their first job. And that's not just to arrive and expect everything to fall out of the sky and that everyone's going to get equal opportunities. Yeah. Most companies will offer equal opportunities, but then you need to put your hand up. You need to connect with the right people. You need to add value. You need to be a nice person to work with. You need to be a team player. All of those cliche things. But what do you think are some of the things that people need to do when they start their first job just to make the connections and the relationship building um, a little bit easier? The best thing is that the best is that you are, and, and in a good way, not because you're a recovery maker in the, in the open plan that you get pulled in, but um, don't creep the people. So I'm a pretty sociable person in that regard. I... If I walk in, I, I take 20 minutes to get to my seat because I'll go into every door and I said, just greet the people. And they might not work with you at the time, but they'll know of you. And, and, and they'll get to know the character behind the person, but not, not just the whole room off, but, but they'll actually start asking you questions, greet you back. Um, yeah, be, be that person that actually greets them. And, and especially the higher ranking people. But also your peers, be, be, like you said, be a nice person to work with. So my first thing would be to, to go and greet those people every morning that you get to the office. Don't just walk in, be a ghost and go and sit at your table, but be a human, be, be friendly to them, greet them. Then at least take up a lot of their time, but, but at least be visible then. Another thing, and I know you were very good with that, John, is, um, the the boss's PA is like superwoman. She's a superman in that office. You you need to be very visible to the PA and and um, try and assist with mundane tasks or carrying boxes or do something to to add value to that PA's life. And whenever you need a meeting with uh, with superiors with high ranking people. That PA is going to be your corner. So very much something that you need to, to try and do. One other thing that, I'm, uh, that I like to do on my side, but I don't know if it ever added value in my life, but it's to, to really be interested in the other person. Try and find out what they're about. Uh, learn from them, hear what they did this weekend. To just be a genuine human and, and talk nonsense to the, to the people so that you get to know them on a level. 
this is then from a work uh, perspective. Um, and then, then I think you get the opportunity to put some idea somewhere or to, to ask for something because you've got something to move on to uh, with that person. So those are some of the things that I would do. I'm also a very big coffee drinker, so I would hear a lot of what's going on around the coffee <laughs> coffee machine, especially with the AMG, there was this filter, filter coffee that I, that I would tap into quite a bit from the work, and, and they also wrote quite a lot of what was going on. Um, are the single things that you would add, John? I think I stole the PA one from you, um, but there are many things that you can still think of forever and above these three. No, look, the, the PA one, the secretary one, the admin staff one is a big favorite of mine. Those, those are the people that actually run the show. They, they, they keep everyone on track. They're keeping the bosses on track. And they're also the people that if you impress them, and, and this might be very cliche, but they are the head of the gossip food chain. The admin staff, the secretaries, the PAs, they know what's happening with everyone, the relationships, the fights, all that type of stuff. So if, if you're not impressing them, or if you're making a bad impression, that is going to spread like wildfire. And another thing that I, that I tell young people is remember, um, performance evaluation is happening 365 days a year. So you can't just wait until October or January when there's performance reviews and stuff, and then you want to pull up your socks and then you want to do the right thing and be helpful. I mean, people are going to see through that. So. You need to be aware that performance evaluation is happening. People are watching what you're doing, how you're interacting, how you're treating them, how helpful are you? Uh, do you? Do you participate in meetings, in team building? Do you show up on time and things like that? So definitely the admin staff. I also think then just also making connections with other people in different business units. So not just knowing the people in your unit. I mean, that's the bare minimum. But if you're in if you're in the accounts department, who who's in the HR department, or who else is in the building, the floor below, above you, the floor below you, in the cubicle section next door to you, also interacting with those people because that then colors in your your view of the company and the direction things are going, and you never know who you're going to speak to. You might be speaking to someone in the strategy department and say, oh, I actually really like the sound of this. Maybe I should come and work here, or maybe there's a project that can get involved in there. So, so making use of those opportunities to network just wider than your unit. And, and I mean, it's always good to, to go to maybe like a year end function and you've got 45 people to talk to instead of the four people in your unit. And, and again, the people see that they see your visibility, they see your usefulness. There's, there's no promises that it's going to lead you to becoming the CEO one day, but it's going to definitely help you in terms of career progression, promotions, opportunities for, for amazing projects um, and things like that. Um, so Rudolf, maybe another question to think about is what are some of the pitfalls of starting your first job? Some, some things that you should definitely not do, some things that you should avoid, um, like the plague. Um, that can really be a career limiting move in your in your first job. You got any ideas on that? I think the, the biggest thing, and uh, it's something that I'm charged, unfortunately, quite a bit as well, is to not come late. Do not come all late, especially when you want to, you need to make a person look the part. Come come up, come very early, dress the part, um, tuck in your shirt, simple things, but. Um, Things that, that make a, a, a basic improvement on, on people. And that is actually impressive. But if you don't do it, that it degrades, it downgrades you down that picking order very quickly. So it's important to, to just do those basics right as a start. And then um, I think also not to try and be everything to everyone immediately. You need to. You do, uh, mind, mind other people's time as well. Um, don't be a nuisance. We don't be in the way, but, but try and learn as much as you can, as quickly as you can, um, without being uh, a, a test almost. Don't, don't get into the way um, of, of doing uh, their things as well. Yeah, don't be a wisecrack. Um, do your thing, get your job done, show them that you are reliable, trustworthy, that you, you can do the job, 
um, and add value as much as you can. But then be a nugget or a, a small event. If you have an idea, share it. Um, I don't think that's wrong. It's just that you, um, if you try and hog the limelight the whole time, people will start working you out. So that's also something that you need to be quite mindful of. And then I think um, the quality of your work, uh, still over and above relationship and so on. If you do things wrong, if you don't do the job, that work will spread faster than your your actual hard work in trying to build this whole networking connection side of yours. Your bad reputation spreads a lot faster than that. So it comes down to the basics, I suppose, is to do the right things, do work consistently, get your job done, meet the targets. Um, and then to add on is to do the connection side of it, because that's, that's what gets you in front. But you're never going to get in front if you don't do um, your primary work very well. Um, so it's, it's that is so important um, from, from my point of view. Do you have something to add there, John? Um, I would agree with you um, on, on the wisecrack one. I've, I've seen some, some juniors start in their, in their first job and they've got an opinion on everything and how they know everything. And because they've done yeah. one audit, they're an absolute master on the audit process. And I'm like, dude, you haven't got a leg to stand on. You, you couldn't run an audit um, to save your life yet. But they are so strongly opinionated on, on the little that they've achieved and I sometimes wonder, is this coming from a place of insecurity or is it coming from a place of just, this is how they are. They are so overconfident, but when it comes to work, they, they actually have no clue. So, so they bamboozle people with, with big words and how amazing they are. And people are, well, he must be amazing because he says he's amazing. <laughs> but I think you can, you, can, you can run out of life quite quickly. Um, the other thing that I would avoid doing Besides being late, I mean, that, that, that is also just, just criminal. The other thing that I would avoid doing is, is trying to unsettle teams. I think we're trying to unsettle the bosses or I can't believe we have, we have to be listening to the assistant manager or the manager. So, so there's a lot of toxic team members out there. And, and this is something that, we, uh, that, that um, Yoko touched on uh, recently in our podcast with her. So do not be a toxic teammate. Do not be the one that spreads rumors, that, that unsettles the team dynamics, that self-sabotages the team. And don't be the, 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 you know, the fly in the ointment, the, the, the person that holds the whole team back. Um, just be aware of, of what you say. And, and especially in a new job, some of these people you met on day one and now you have to work together. You don't want to throw yourself under the bus or the team under the bus from the early stages. So start slow, check everything out, be nice, be easy to work with. And I think you can go really far. It's like, it's like, like you said, the basics. The basics are the basics because they are the basics and the basics work. And the basics will keep you out of trouble. And the basics will help you keep your job. And uh, you, there's enough time to become a high flyer. It's not necessarily... The first week or the first month um, at your new job. Check the scene out a bit. What the question, so, so since you at the engine now with this discussion and it was your first big job, uh, you, you actually worked your way into some international audits. You went to three, four, five different countries for the United Nations audits. So, um, which of those principles that we spoke of or, or are things that you utilize to? To get into the room there, to get to get to that point to to actually be part of these teams, because it wasn't part of the structures that we worked in. It was a completely separate division. So, yeah, how did you get that right? When did you apply? Um, when did you technique on this to get in? Yeah, that's a very interesting story. It was actually on our first day in the in the boardroom uh, where Alice was there, and Alice was talking and and talking about the different, um, I think, divisions within the AG and she mentioned international audit and I asked her about that and she said, no, we audit, we were one of the auditors on the rotation basis of the United Nations. I mean, by then I had never even left the country and I was just fascinated with this idea that I can go and work overseas and see other countries and it's just expand my horizons a bit. And so I started following up on that opportunity and, and luckily I think that people were on the same floor and, um, 
again met the admin lady who controls everything and was booking the flights and asking her how does this work uh, met henry the manager met hein the manager and so i'm talking to them and how does this work and and the timing and everything like that and my my first opportunity to go overseas happened literally a year later uh, when i went to jordan um to one of the united nations uh, relief works agency um in Amman in jordan and went to Gaza and the West Bank and Israel, and it was absolutely mind blowing. But it took a lot of, um, I would say, legwork. And and if you hear an opportunity, just go and do a little bit of homework. Don't just dismiss it. That is not for me. I'll never get in. If you say you'll never get in, you'll never get in. But I followed up and followed up and checked in and and made sure. Look, I need to do my job properly. I can't let Mariana down. I can't let the team down. And obviously, the timing has to work. And luckily, it did. Um, it didn't mean that I had no leave for the year because I, had, I was working flat out, but it was good for for recoverability and things like that. Um, yeah, so so it was an amazing experience, but it started with hearing an opportunity, following up on the opportunity, and and trying to make it happen. And then that was the thing with those people. I thought you um, you you obviously had to present yourself well, but also to build a relationship and. Yeah, you know, a relationship is not just one email, one phone call. It's continuous and 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 showing face and and yes, doing your job well, but also um, meeting up with the people that can make those things happen for you. So yeah, I must say I wasn't I wasn't on the same train, but I at some stage I was a little bit jealous of it. Just this sounds amazing, yeah, but um, yeah, it was I was always quite keen to hear how it went. And I think at the end you got you got engaged in New York, wasn't it? Um, that you also on one of these trips, or am I mistaken? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, my last trip I was to New York City. We were there for four or five it's weeks for the two United States program. And my brother came across, uh, Judy came across, and you know, there wasn't a better place to propose uh, to my future wife than, than New York City. So again, I had to make it happen, I had to figure it out, I had to take some time off. Um, from work to go find a ring and, and you know, all that stuff. And that's a whole nother long story for another day, I think. Yeah, but it, it just got to take advantage of those opportunities um, and, and, and try and make things happen. And if it doesn't happen the first time, maybe it will happen the second time. Yeah, that's, that's about it for today. Um, there's so much to unpack here. And, and obviously, we're telling a bit of stories of what we've been through, but the principles are the same. And... And that the same starting a new job freshly out of university or out of school, but they still remain the same if you're 45 years old, starting a new job in a new environment. It's exactly the same principles. It's not different things to go and apply. To get into that job is also easier through connecting and networking than just throwing your CV into a hat. Um, so I think that is that's also something to be mindful of to, uh, the change of jobs to to utilize this relationship building strategy almost um, to get into that new job and whether you you're eighteen or eighty the same rules apply and doing the basics right connecting with the right people and once the opportunity mm. comes up that you in a position to grasp it. Absolutely, we will 100% agree with you. No, it's been a great conversation. Thanks again. Thanks, John. Yeah, good. We'll see you again uh, at the right place. Cheers.